Remember the time when everyone was ditching Intel Elder Lake because of these stupendously expensive motherboards? Well, enter the B660 motherboards. Now this is an MSI Mag B660M motor and it has everything. DDR5 support? Check. Great build quality? Check. Great unboxing experience? Let's talk about that. The boxing wasn't overdone. It's not a dual layer packaging that you would expect from boards at this range. But the stuff that MSI includes in the box overdoes this. You get all of your regular paperwork and stuff, a disc, now this is old school. Some fancy leaflets, all of your antennas and cables, screwdrivers and this. Okay, this is a sticker set that allows you to customize a motherboard in its own military way. It even has a battery sticker included in it, check these out. Man, I am impressed. First off, the screwdrivers make your life so much easier. And now this, I am giving the unboxing experience a solid 8 of 10. Okay now this board isn't an attention grabber. It has a strong duo tone design going around it and I dig its looks. MSI packs some chunky heat sinks in the VRM area and an integrated rear IO cover. I like this. Now the best part about the recent MSI motherboards is how user friendly they have become. Let me give you a quick example. Figuring out dual channels is a bit difficult for beginner builders, right? MSI walks you around that problem by indicating which slots you should populate first. It's not that someone who has built a few PCs in the past would need this, but I kind of like the attention to detail. The next thing pops up when you turn this board around. It shows the portions where you should avoid a collision with the case. Yeah, now this is another cool attention to detail. Now you get two PCIe X16 slots with this motherboard. One of them is Gen 4 and is still riveted to handle all of those massive and chunky RTX 30 series cards and the other one is a PCIe Gen 3 slot. But check this out, almost all of the pins do not have any connection at all. So it is a functional Gen 3 X4 slot, better do not put any high-end graphics card in there or you might be losing a lot of performance. Also do not buy this board if you are planning to build a multi graphics card system, look at the H670 or the Z690 platforms in that case. Now B660 is a PCIe Gen 5.0 platform, but MSI kind of missed out on that with this motherboard. So this is still capable of Gen 4 and although that might not be a problem now, it can become one after the 40 series cards drop later this year. You also get a PCIe X1 slot in the middle and two M.2 slots. Now the best part about these slots is that both of them are Gen 4 with full size heat sinks. However, if you populate both of them, you will lose out on one SATA port. Oh and talking about SATA, let us look at them. There are 6 SATA ports in this motherboard. 4 of them are at 90 degrees so that will help with cable management and do not have to twist the SATA cables. And 2 of them are vertically placed in the bottom of the motherboard. Now 4 of these slots are controlled by the B660 chipset and 2 of them are controlled by the AS Media ASMU 1061 chipset. This means that 2 of these ports also do not support RAID functionality. Now although this is an entry level motherboard, MSI still packs easy debug LEDs in it. Now the BX60 platform is slowly getting some overclocking features like memory overclocking, so I think these LEDs will come in handy. Ok now it's not all good good about this motherboard, the rear IO ports seriously need some attention. This board has a single 20 Gbps port, 3 10 Gbps ports and the rest of them are USB 2 ports. Why did you miss out on USB 5 Gbps port? And also USB 2 kind of completely looks out of fashion in 2022. I appreciate the presence of a 2.5G LAN and the Wi-Fi and audio port are standard. But following MSI's formula of simplification, the audio out speaker jack is marked in red. I appreciate that, but the rear I/O needed more USB 3 ports and at least another 20 Gbps port because this is 2022. Now I got the GDR5 Wi-Fi variant of this motherboard in for review. There is also a non-Wi-Fi variant which is available in the market. This motherboard, the Wi-Fi GDR5 version will cost you around $240, while the non-Wi-Fi variant comes in at $20 cheap at around $219. In India, you will only find the GDR4 version for sale. That board kind of goes around the 17,000 INR mark and judging by the market trends, I guess that the GDR5 version version will go for around 23,000 to 24,000 INR, whenever it enters the market. The board does not have any RGB on it and that is kind of 
weird, more so because I am a big RGB fan, but the presence of two J rainbow ports is quite dope. You will have no hassle in plugging in as many RGB devices as possible. Overall, I'm giving this board an 8 of 10 in terms of features. Now, let's talk about the heat sinks and VRMs of this motherboard a bit. The motherboard has a lot of heatsink on it. The B660 chipset has a chunky heatsink on top of it, but it sits at around 39 degrees all of the time. I mean, now 39 degrees is not a bad temperature at all, provided the ambient temperature was around 24 degrees. But this motherboard could have easily benefited from a bigger heatsink in the PCH area. Yeah, I know there are size constraints in MATX motherboards, and you will have to give up on this a bit. The VRM heatsinks weigh in at around 350. 57 grams, while the PCH heatsink weighs in at around 107 grams. The IO cover also gets a bit warm while the board is functional, and that thing weighs in at around 254 grams. The heatsinks are quite decent and they look promising. I'm giving them a 7.5 of 10. Okay, now the board has a 12 phase VRM configuration, but they are in what MSI calls a duet design, but, but that means that the VRMs are teamed up in a parallel connection, and this is not a true 12 phase design. The 12 power stages that you will find on this motherboard are from Renaissance and they're Renaissance ISL 99360 60 amp stages. Yeah, that was a mouthful. But there are also two other stages that you can see on this motherboard. One of them is for controlling the iGPU on your processor and that is also the same Renaissance ISL 99360 stage. The other auxiliary power supply stage is not from Renaissance, it is from Monolithic Power Systems, their MP879970 amp stage. MSI is also using a Renaissance chip for the CPU PWM control. And I don't have anything to complain about these, provided this motherboard is a budget option. The VCC AUX is however controlled by a M2940A PWM because it uses a monolithic power stage. Overall, the VRM design kind of looks promising for a budget option. But hold on until we torture test these poor things. 6.5 of 10 for this design. MSI just could have written 6 phase parallel connection stages. Okay, so now it is time to build with this motherboard. I do not have any complaints about the building experience with this motherboard, but the LGA1700 socket is kind of tight. That's Ooh. what she said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a bit too resistant. Also, I'm using the Core i5-12400 Intel's latest budget killer, some hyper-fast DDR5 Kingston Fury Beast 5200MHz memory modules, and MSI's K360 cooler. Man, I love how this looks. The board will look fine in both black and white builds because of the strong duotone design. I'm giving the building experience a 7.5 of 10. No surprises, no gimmicks just the standard procedure. Now I will be conducting all of the tests in an open air test bench, more like a test chair, but here are the results. Okay, time to boot this baby. Now I like the way MSI has designed the BIOS. It is based on American Megatrends firmware, but the way MSI has customized the GUI is absolutely commendable. You have an easy mode and a regular mode as usual. The easy mode is quite well made for an easy mode. It gives you all the information that a basic user would need like CB frequency, DRAM frequency, XMP information and all the stuff. It isn't as detailed as a regular mode that you can access with the press of the F7 key. Now I have some thoughts on the overclocking features of this motherboard. You have an expert mode and a normal mode. The normal mode has all of the stuff a beginner overclocker would need, but the expert stuff is for the pros. It has everything. Plus MSI's memory triad feature also speeds up the overclocking process. I had an absolutely wonderful time overclocking with this motherboard and I am giving this a solid 8.5 of 10. Okay, now let's move further with this motherboard. Now, MSI has shifted to the MSI Center software with all of the recent offerings and this software is really a step up from Dragon Center. Now, MSI Center had a few KVRs even a few months ago, but now it is almost there. I was controlling the screen on the K360 cooler and the RGB fans with it. Now, that is not a lot of RGB, but I had zero problems while using it. Quite decent, I would say. MSI Center also supports Razer Chroma software, so that adds extra brownie points. I'm giving this software a 7.5 of 10. MSI Center has really improved a lot over the last few months, and if MSI continues doing this, this software can easily become the best board control software out there. Okay, now let's get into the testing. Let's start with audio. You see this orange line over here, right? This separates the audio section from the rest of the board to avoid any electrical noises and other stuff interfering with the audio output. 
Comfort. High quality stuff. The board also runs the ALC1200 audio codec from Realtek. Now this isn't the latest creation from the company nor is it their best creation ever. Board manufacturers started using this codec from all the way back in 2018 but this thing is still quite decent. It still has every feature that you could ask for like digital SPDIF support, 7.1 channel output. Practically, I have loved the audio output from this motherboard and I can guarantee if you are an audiophile, you will have a great time listening to music with this motherboard. I am giving the audio capabilities of this motherboard a solid 8.5 of 10. You will love it. Okay, now let's talk about the signature feature of this motherboard. And I have to include this because MSI also sells a non-Wi-Fi variant of this motherboard which goes for $20 cheaper. Now the onboard Wi-Fi is from Intel and it is capable of Wi-Fi 6E. And it also has support for all of the features that you could ask for like dual band support and MU MIMO. The onboard LAN is from Realtek and it is a 2.5G port. Now is it the fastest on the market? No. How many people have a connection speed faster than 2.5 Gbps? Almost zero. The Wi-Fi is a tad slower than the LAN as I found in my testing but, but the performance gap is very small and I think LAN is just enjoying the wired benefit over here. The included Bluetooth chip is capable of Bluetooth 5.2 and it is quite stable. Like I had no problems playing games with my Xbox controller and probably the only things people use Bluetooth for these days. Yeah and we also have keyboards and mice. You will have no problems with those use case scenarios. Overall I'm giving Bluetooth and Wi-Fi a 7.5 of 10. It is not something fancy fancy but it will get your job done pretty well. Next up, let's talk about the storage interfaces. Now as I mentioned earlier, this motherboard has 6 SATA ports. 4 of them connect directly to the Intel B660 chipset and 2 of them the SATA A and SATA B ports connect to the AS Media ASM1061 chip. Now this does mean that the SATA A and SATA B ports are also a tad slower than the SATA 5 to 8 ports. Not something you should be concerned about because the performance chip will be very small but if you're planning to connect all of your drives in RAID then avoid the SATA A and B ports. Next up let's look at the M.2 ports. Now both of these are Gen 4 ports and all but one of them connect directly to the CPU while another one connects to the B660 chipset. Now you might think that this will severely limit the performance of one or the other but there is no performance difference between them. I was running a Gen 4 drive on both of these chipsets but as you can see there is only a little performance drop that no one cares about. Now in terms of storage headers and rear IO ports, I would have loved to see more USB 3 ports. This motherboard comes with a single USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 port so another one or two would have easily helped the situation. Also talking about the internal headers, this thing has two USB 2 headers that can connect a total of 6 USB 2 ports. It also has one USB 3 5 Gbps header that can connect a total of 3 USB 3 ports and also a single USB 10 Gbps type C header. Now I will say the same, this motherboard could have easily benefited from more USB 3 5 Gbps headers because all of the modern cases that you will find these days have completely moved forward to USB 3 so the more the merrier. I am giving the storage interfaces a 6 of 10. This did not feel good to me. Now I tested this motherboard with the Core i5 12400. Now that processor is locked and it has a turbo frequency of 4.4 GHz. Now this motherboard was handling those frequencies with an ease. Now I won't be talking about processor benches because that is out of the scope of this video. But if you are planning to couple a Core i5 12400 with this motherboard, you are going to be absolutely fine. I even think this board will handle a Core i5 12600 with an ease. So let's finally talk about the overclocking potential of this thing. Now this is a B660 motherboard and there is absolutely no way to alter the CPU frequencies or voltages or anything like that. So the only thing that you can do is memory overclocking and since we have some DDR5 memory on hand, it is time to go dark. The memory overclocking results were not spectacular but this is DDR5 and these are the earliest chips you are getting this generation. So there is a lot of refinement to do and I think that the DDR5 memory overclocking scenario will get better with time. Now the XMP profiles of the RAM that I was using are 4800MHz at CL38 and 5200MHz at CL40. So I started with 5333MHz at CL40. It boots out just fine, it even passed the IDA 64 benchmark but IDA 64 is flawed. So I tried Linpack Extreme and 
there we have a fail. Next it made it to 5400 MHz at CL40. You know what, I was starting to get impressed at this point. Yeah, it still failed the Lintback Extreme test but it passed IDA64 and the system was quite stable. But 5600 MHz did not boot at CL40 and I had to loosen the timings to CL42. But that is still quite respectable. The system booted up, IDA64 passed and Lintback failed yet again. But the sticks did not get to anything about 5600 MHz at CL42. Now it started getting into multiple BSODs until Windows went corrupt and I give up at that point. Now I will be making a dedicated video on overclocking these RAM sticks because I could have easily pushed them a bit further if I loosened the timings a bit more or even gave them a bit more voltage to play around with. So stay tuned for that. Now I am giving the overclocking potential of this motherboard a 6 of 10. The thing that brought the score down was the lack of CPU OC support but the thing that kept the score up was how easy MSI has made overclocking on their motherboards. You would really enjoy it. Okay, time to torture the VRMs now. Everyone was waiting for this, weren't you? I recorded the temperatures by placing two K-type thermocouples in the two VRM bays. The temperatures were actively locked every 5 seconds by two digital thermometers. Okay, so let's start with something lighter. IDA64. Now the VRM temperatures are very respectable in this test. You can see a maximum delta of 6 degrees over the idling temperatures. Now the VRMs have chunky heat sinks on this motherboard and also the fact that we are stress testing a Core i5-12400 is helping with the numbers. A beefier processor with a much higher power limit could have easily taken a toll on these chips. Moving over to the VRM torture test using the blend preset in Prime95, we saw the temperatures shoot up by a few more degrees. Now these are still acceptable provided neither IDA64 nor Prime95 are real world test scenarios. So the VRMs will stay much colder during your daily usage. Now I am giving the VRM performance a solid 7.5 of 10. We could stress the VRMs more by placing a beefier KCDs chip in there, but why would someone do that? Why would someone pick up this severely limited platform if an unlocked K-series chip is what you're after? Okay, so at the end of the day, this motherboard is still not available in the Indian market. You will only find the DDR4 version which is going for around 17,000 rupees. Now in the US, this motherboard is selling for around $239 and that is just $20 poultry of the Tomahawk B660 motherboard which is a full size ATX motherboard with its own set of pros and cons. Now this makes me think, isn't this motherboard a bit overpriced? Now judging by the market trends and the terrible pricing scenario of DDR5 memory and motherboards, I think this motherboard will fear for around 23,000 to 24,000 INR whenever it launches in the market. And that makes this motherboard even less value for money. Well, DDR5 is great. This motherboard is great, but I cannot recommend this to anyone in a budget because of the terrible and awful pricing of this thing. DDR5 will easily need another year to come down in pricing and by then we will have a B760 in the market. But if you're looking to buy the DDR4 variant of this motherboard, go for it. I haven't tested it for any caveats but it looks promising. For the score, I'm giving this motherboard a 5.5 of 10 in the value segment and we have an average score. 7.37 of 10. Cybertech Talk Silver Award. There you have it. Okay, so for the bottom line, this is a great motherboard with features like DDR5 support from MSI, but the pricing kind of upsets me. And since this board has been built for budget audiences, I find that fact even harder to digest. B660 is an already starved platform, so better look at other competitive offerings like the B660 Tomahawk, which I think is more value for money than this motherboard. But if you're looking for something smaller than ATX and MATX, avoid the B660 platform. LGA 1700 and ITX is a huge problem. Probably check out this B560i motherboard from MSI. It has a smaller socket and it was a great motherboard to be honest.